I'm sure that every one of us recognizes that two factors make possible such a lectureship as this. One is the providence of Jehovah God, the other is the disposition of people just like you who are willing to make it possible. And we appreciate both of these and acknowledge them with a great deal of profound gratitude. It's truly a joy to be here. I appreciate the deep honor behind the invitation. It truly is a wonderful opportunity to be with you. I just want to express my genuine gratitude to Brother Holland, the School of Preaching here, and the entire Williams Road congregation for extending to me an opportunity to be present. In fact, it's good to be in a place where there's not a great deal of fog, at least as far as the inside of this building is concerned. I've been in a gospel meeting for the last seven or eight days over in Clarington. That's about 130 or 40 miles east of here. And I've been driving in fog since about 6.15 or 6.30 this morning and got here barely in time to hear the last portion of Brother David Light. And I don't know which is worse, driving in the fog on uh, winding, narrow roads in eastern Ohio or being in the fog on an interstate and not knowing what is just a little ways ahead. In fact, I hadn't been gone from the place where I was staying long this morning between Clarington, Ohio and Bellsville, Ohio. Couldn't see much more than from here, say, to that attendance chart over there. And all at once on my side of the road, there was a great big cow. And really, my goal was not a confrontation with a cow this morning. But fortunately, there was no car coming the other direction, and I could sway in order to meet the animal. She never bothered to move a bit. She evidently trusted my driving implicitly. <laughs> I will not be able to be here tonight. I close out the meeting at Clarington. It was originally scheduled to be a 10-day effort. They are allowing me to close with eight days, and I'll be driving back in the morning to be with you for the rest of the sessions tomorrow and Wednesday. I'm delighted to speak on the topic that has been assigned me at this hour, the Bible versus emotionalism. And I want to emphasize that we're talking about versus emotionalism. I believe the title has been correctly given because it is not the Bible and emotionalism as though the two traveled in the same direction but it is one versus the other. When I began to think in terms of an appropriate text, there was one that really came to mind almost immediately. It is an observation that has been a part of the Bible for about 3,000 years now, and Solomon, the wisest of the ages, suggested, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Emotionalism is certainly a way that seems right to multiplied masses of people today. And yet the end of it is certainly spiritual death, eternal death. I believe that I am well in the mark of accuracy this morning when I suggest to you that one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant, drive in current day religion is based upon emotionalism upon the feelings of the human heart and not upon the objective truths of God Almighty. And for that reason, we're going to be talking about something that opposes emotionalism this morning, and that something is the exalted and the majestic word of God Almighty. I believe that our lesson can be easily divided into about four or five major areas of consideration. First of all, emotionalism defined and depicted. In the second place, some action examples of emotionalism at work as we see them in the Bible. In the third place, emotionalism in a modern setting. In the fourth place, why emotionalism is not an acceptable foundation in religion. And then in the fifth place, I'm just going to use the topic or the title the Bible versus emotionalism. Exactly what do we mean by emotionalism? I believe that perhaps the finest definition that we could give for it, it is simply a religion that is based upon human feelings. It is a religion that is entirely subjective from beginning to end. 
It is a movement that is an outright rejection and an utter repudiation of the religion that is based upon the objectivity of truth as set forth within God's sacred volume. The very kind of truth that our Lord had in mind when he said to a Jewish audience in John 8, 31, 32, if ye continue in my word, not in emotionalism, not in subjective experiences, but if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, not the workings of emotionalism, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's quite obvious from a consideration of both of these verses that the Lord had in mind the same body of knowledge and wisdom when he called it my word, verse 31, as he did when he styled it the truth in verse 32. Hence, when we talk about the truth, we're talking about the word of the Lord. This is the very thing that our Lord had in mind when he declared in that longest recorded prayer of his, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It's this body of saving truth that our Lord spoke about in John the 18th chapter and verse 37 as he stood in the courts of Governor Pilate and Pilate was inquiring into his identity, where he had come from, exactly what his nature was. And in talking about his kingship, Jesus suggested an answer to the king to the, the governor's question about his kingship, he said, To this end did I come, for this cause have I come into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And I'm just quite sure that the governor must have had ringing skepticism in his voice when he responded, What is truth? John 18:38. He did not even bother to allow Jesus further discussion about what is truth. Jesus had already answered that question. In fact, he stood before Governor Pilate early that Friday morning as the very personification of truth and that which had eluded the great philosophers among the Greeks and the Romans actually was in his very presence, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. There is no going to the Father except by him, John 14 and verse 6. It is this body of saving truth, objective truth, that Paul had in mind when he encourages us to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4 and verse 15. And Paul tells us what the consequences are if we fail to receive a love of truth and with all deceivableness of them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them a working of error, in order that they might believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. As we speak about emotionalism today, please keep in mind that emotionalism really has no time. It has no sympathy for the objectivity of truth as set forth in the Bible. I believe that emotionalism in religion is just about the same thing in that realm as a statement that we're seeing more and more about in regard to morality. That slogan is, if it feels good, do it. Now you've seen that on bumper stickers or perhaps in other places. I remember some years back being on a youth forum with Brother Tom Holland, and as he talked to the young people, he evidently had just seen that statement on a bumper sticker, and his immediate response was to it, about the kindest thing I can say about that philosophy is that it is stupid to the nth degree. Well, I think that it can be said in regard to emotionalism. When a person is building his hopes for eternity upon the feelings of the human heart, whether it be his feelings or the feelings of another fallible human being, then it is stupid to the nth degree. Again, I believe that in emotionalism, we see something that causes for the widest of variation the widest of differences, because my feelings may not be the same as yours. Yours may not be the same as mine. There's going to be variation between individuals and between groups of individuals. 
And you know, emotionalism would be hard-pressed indeed to find fault with anybody's accepted guidelines as long as they simply rest upon, I'm doing what my feelings tell me to do. I'm simply determining my course in life by what I feel is the best uh, method of living for me. I believe that in emotionalism we see the very opposite of that which Habakkuk suggested in Habakkuk 2 and 20, how that the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silent before him. God should be the center of our religion, but emotionalism places man at the center. Uh, Wednesday evening I'm going to be speaking on the Bible versus humanism, and humanism is simply making man the measure of everything. As Grecian philosophy, Philosophers began to teach some four or five hundred years before the birth of Christianity. And to a large degree, emotionalism is making man the center of everything as far as religious thought, religious life, and religious activity are all concerned. I believe that it goes against the grain of 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let a group of people be charged with nothing but emotionalism, and you'll not see 1 Corinthians 14 and 40 in action. No doubt many of you have attended debates that some of our brethren have conducted with the Pentecostal and the holiness proponents, and it's just absolutely difficult to keep any kind of order among their people while our brethren are trying to present their arguments and setting forth their side. I remember some years ago traveling from my home with another gospel preacher and crossing the Mississippi River and going over to Kennett, Missouri. That was when Brother Guy in Woods was meeting Marvin Hicks. And in my judgment, he rendered Hicks a decisive defeat in that debate. But Brother Corlew and I, as we went together, we didn't get there quite as soon as we intended. We had to cross by a ferry and uh, the ferry was just leaving as we were approaching the banks of the Mississippi, but we were a little bit late in getting there. We had to take seats wherever we could find them. And it just so happened that we sat in the very midst of a Pentecostal group, and there was talking and disharmony and interruptions from this group aimed toward Brother Woods throughout the entirety of every speech that he gave. And that has been true in every debate that I've ever attended when these people are in attendance. They are charged up by emotionalism. They believe that they have something within them that is far more important than anything you and I can read and find in the Bible. And they have carried emotionalism to a dangerous degree indeed. I believe, therefore, in defining and setting forth what we mean by emotionalism it is a religion that is based upon human feelings and not an appeal made to the word of the living God. Are there examples of emotionalism set forth in the Bible? Indeed, there are. Please keep in mind that we're talking about when a man decides to allow his feelings to become his guideline. I believe that emotionalism was very much at work at the base of Mount Sinai, Exodus, the 32nd chapter. Moses has gone to the summit of Sinai in order to receive inscribed upon the stones the table of laws, the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue. He was gone for a period of 40 days and 40 nights, as you will recall. While gone, the people began to pressure his older brother Aaron with such words as, as for this man Moses, we know not what has become of him. Therefore, make us gods to go before us. And Aaron, not exercising the backbone that he should have upon this occasion, listened to this power-packed device from the disgruntled and from the dissatisfied Israelites and made for them a golden calf. We find in the situation that followed not only idolatrous worship as they began to offer sacrificial offerings to it, but also an engagement in fleshly indulgences. The Bible talks about their sitting down to eat and drink, and their arising to play. 
And we can be assured of the fact that the playing in which they were engaged was not that of the wholesome variety at all. Moses was called down to find these people shamefully engaged in idolatry and immorality. They had allowed their emotions to become carried away and had forgotten what God had so eloquently enunciated twelve chapters before into their very ears as he announced the law that was to guide and govern them. Yet in their emotional framework they had swept underneath their unholy feet the very principles of the Ten Commandment law and had uh, given sway to emotionalism at work. I believe that emotionalism is set forth in a basic statement that is made in the book of Judges. Judges has sometimes been referred to as the dark ages of Hebrew history. Indeed, an uh, appraisal of that uh, uh, perilous period of time. But there is a statement that occurs in Judges 17, 6, and almost an equivalent of it in Judges 21, 25, that in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Isn't that basically what emotionalism is all about? Doing that which is right in one's own eyes? And if you read the intervening stories between Judges 17 and 6 and Judges 21 and 25, you can find some of the greatest crimes perpetrated in Israelite history at the very time when everyone was doing that which was right in his own eyes. I believe that Captain Naaman, the leprous leader of the Syrian host, would be an example of emotionalism at work. Remember he learned through a little captured Jewish maid, whose name is not given by inspiration, about the great prophet in Israel that could recover her Syrian master of his leprosy. Provisions were immediately made for him to go to the land of Israel. First of all, he is sent to the king, but the king does not possess the power to heal this man of his leprosy. And then he is sent to God's prophet, Elisha. Captain Naaman had already made up his mind what the prophet of God was going to do. And when he camped outside the residence of the prophet of God, the prophet did not even show so much as his face, but simply sent a message, go down to the river Jordan, dip in it seven times, and your leprosy will be a thing of the past. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings 5, 11, and 12 how that Naaman was wroth when he heard this. He said, Behold, I thought that surely the prophet of God will come out, he will stand, he will um, call upon the name of the Lord his God, he will strike the hand over the place, quite literally I believe in the Hebrew, it means move up and down the hand over the places of leprosy, and he'll recover me of my leprosy. The Bible tells us that he raises the thought, are not the rivers of Abanon far for better than all the waters of Israel? May I not dip in them and be cleansed? And the Bible tells us that he went away in a rage. Had it not been for calmer and more deliberate counsel on the part of the servants accompanying him, no doubt the Syrian captain would have returned to his land and perhaps died as a leper. Founder counsel suggested why not give it a try and when he did his leprosy departed from him. Naaman made the mistake of following his own feelings unwilling at first to give any kind of credence or credence any kind of obedience to what the prophet of God suggested. I believe that we have another example of emotionalism at work in the great contest that ensued between Elijah the great champion of Jehovah God in a decadent period of Israelite history, and the hundreds of false prophets who represented Baal. You remember the details, how they assembled upon Mount Carmel, a rugged, majestic, beautiful ridge of mountains lying adjacent to the mighty Mediterranean Sea, and the details had been worked out, how that each group would have a sacrificial victim and we will allow the God who exists to answer by fire. 
the, the prophet of God gave the false prophets the first opportunity. They began to cry out for Baal to come down and answer by fire. It may well be the case that Baal was the sun god. If so, this was the very realm in which he should have been able to operate effectively and promptly. But all of their calling forth for Baal to answer went to no avail. As they would call and call, Elijah occasionally would taunt them sarcastically and very justifiably. He would say, maybe you need to speak a little bit more loudly. Maybe he's a slave. Maybe he's talking to someone and your message is not getting through to him. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe you're sending the message to the wrong place. And then in desperation, they began to mutilate their own bodies until the blood gushed forth but all to no avail because there was no answer from the false deity known as Baal. That is an example of emotionalism at work. If you want to say emotionalism versus God's word, we have it in concrete form personified before us. Baal's prophets represent emotionalism at work and the prophet of God, Elijah, when it came his time, he had the sacrificial offering saturated with water, called deliberately, calmly, confidently for his God to answer, and this God on high did answer his prophet upon the earth. In this account, we have emotionalism and God's word in direct conflict. I believe we have some examples of emotionalism at work in the New Testament. I cannot help but feel as that mighty throng of people influenced by their Jewish leaders what to say in the courts of Pilate early that Friday morning as they answered the question, what shall I do with Jesus of Nazareth? And they cried out, let him be crucified. Again, when Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? They let it be known, we have no king but Caesar. Anybody that is against Caesar is certainly not our friend. They let it be known that Caesar only is our king. They call for the crucifixion of our Lord. That is emotionalism at work. Think of all the great lessons that they had heard the prophet from Galilee preach and teach, the mighty miracles that they had witnessed, all the wonderful words of life that he had spoken in this very city time after time, occasion after occasion. And yet all of these had to be swept underneath their unholy feet as they cried out, let him be crucified. And the emotionalism did not cease when they left Pilate's court. It traveled with them to Execution Hill that day. And the passers-by, the Jewish leadership suggested, now this is the one that said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it again. Why doesn't he save himself? Or if he be the king of Israel, let him not descend the cross and we'll believe him. Let God deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am or I belong to God. Even the two dying robbers early in the crucifixion scene cast the same in his teeth. That is emotionalism at work where they had discarded every objective truth that Jesus had ever delivered, every prophecy that any Old Testament prophet had ever written, and of which they should have had more than a superficial knowledge. I believe that we see emotionalism at work in the stoning of the saintless Stephen. Stephen's message occupies more verses than any other one sermon in the book of Acts. That's a standing tribute to the greatness of this man and to the last message that he gave prior to his suffering as the first martyr for the master. His speech is built around the concept of Israel's rejection of God, God's law, and God's prophet. His listening audience is composed supposedly of the most calm and most deliberate body of people in all of the land, the Sanhedrin court. And yet these men, as they listened to Stephen, as he went through their history and suggested how that theirs had been a history of rejection of God and his cause in generation after generation, they became so filled with wrath, the Bible tells us that they were cut to the heart but it wasn't a conviction of sin. 
It wasn't uh, the kind of heart change that the people on Pentecost in Acts 2 had experienced. It was a, a cutting to the heart that was filled with wrath and anger and malice. The Bible tells us that they gnashed on him with their teeth. Have you ever seen anybody get so mad that he could almost bite the object of his hatred, his animosity, his dislike? I suppose that if they could have gotten their teeth on Stephen, they would have bitten him. The Bible tells us how that they cast him out of the city. They stopped their ears. They began to cry out loudly. What behavior for men who supposedly are the very representatives of Hebrew justice at its best, and yet they are treating Stephen, a man who had told them the truth, in such fashion as this. Their emotionalism carried them to the place where they actually stoned him. Acts the 8th chapter and the closing, or Acts the 7th chapter and the closing verses. I believe that we have an example of emotionalism at work in an episode that happened at Ephesus while Paul was there. According to Acts 19 and 20, he stayed there either two years and three months, or later he suggested a three-year period. But nevertheless, there were some seven sons of Siva, and they evidently had watched some of the expelling of demons from bodies that had been inhabited by evil spirits, and they had played or paid particular heed to the formula that had been used, what they would have deemed a successful formula of magic, and hence they chose out a man that had an evil spirit and said, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. The evil spirit answered that he recognized Paul's authority. The name of Jesus was something that he recognized, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was pounced on them, attacked them, and they fled out of that house wounded and naked and in utter humiliation emotionalism at work. And yet those seven sons of Siva could have listened to the greatest logician of this era, the Apostle Paul. They could have listened to a man that was staying in their city for something like two or three years, preaching to them about an objective standard of truth. And yet their minds were dense as far as accepting a thus saith the Lord and their religious practices. I believe that a great many of the problems that Paul faced and dealt with in the Corinthian congregation were really emotionalism at work. They certainly had no objective basis for leaving the name of Christ and deciding to call themselves after the names of men. They certainly, or there certainly, was no justification for all of the multitude of problems they had in regard to spiritual gifts. And yet the very things that Paul describes in chapter 14, he names the gifts in chapter 12, tells how long they'll last chapter 13, and gives rules and regulations for them in verse, or rather in chapter 14. But some of the scenes that he describes, how that one person would be giving a revelation and another would pop up and interrupt, claiming, I just can't keep quiet when I receive a revelation. And the wives of the prophets speaking up from the assembly. It was emotionalism at work. And the same thing is at work among those who still claim they have charismatic gifts today. These are some of the examples of emotionalism in an ancient setting. Now let me say something about emotionalism in a modern day setting. I believe that emotionalism is basically a religion of excitement. They've made excitement their religion, in other words. And there's a great deal of difference between making excitement a religion and in the excitement of real, genuine, bona fide religion. I believe that we ought to be enthusiastic, that we ought to feel exhilaration, that we ought to feel the right kind of excitement about the great news that Jesus Christ has come into the world, about the empty tomb that Brother Dehav told us about a few moments ago and what a beautiful sermon he gave on mental health. As he was speaking today, I recall the days at Freed Hardeman back 30 years ago when I was a student in Brother DeHoff's classes. And Brother DeHoff, I still use sermon material that I received from you in those years. 
But we ought to be excited about the good news of redemption, about the fact that that tomb was found empty and stayed empty. The good news. their religion. Emotionalism has had its heyday in Roman Catholicism and in all levels of Protestant denominationalism. Today the Pope will be coming to our country and there will be literally millions and millions of dollars worth of free editorial, free newspaper and magazine coverage that will be given to his stay while here. Yet he represents a religion that has been far more interested in what the eye can see in ornamental beauty, what the ear can hear, what the hands can feel in their rosary, etc., etc., than they have in hearkening back to the New Testament and simply allowing the scriptures to determine what we're going to do and be in the realm of religion. No one can study Catholicism without realizing that emotionalism has enjoyed a heyday in its beginning and in its continuation, and it now influences, well, it has over a half billion people, members of it, and to a large extent, this half billion plus influences the rest of the world to no little degree. It certainly has had a great heyday in the circles of Protestantism, you perhaps have never dealt with anybody in trying to convert him from Protestantism to the New Testament religion that you didn't have to deal with some aspect of emotionalism. And that's exactly why many of them will pat this the chest where the physical heart is, the blood pump, and say, I wouldn't take what I feel right here for anything that you can find in your Bible. That is emotionalism at work. They're far more interested in how they feel than they are in a thus saith the Lord. The number would be legion that all of us have talked to, no doubt that when we have showed people with an open Bible in their hands, now this is the will of the Lord, and maybe they come back, yes, but I feel like I can be saved in my church. I feel like what I have done is just as good as what you can read in your Bible. I studied with a Baptist lady some years back, and I had deliberately saved 1 Peter 3.21 until the very end of our discussion thinking she surely could not deny it. When we got to it, she said, I see it, it's there, but I just do not believe it. In her heart, she was convinced that she had been saved the very moment that she believed with no further steps in Bob. That is emotionalism at work. The whole range of the charismatic movement today is based upon the concept of emotionalism. These people who imagine that they have the Holy Spirit working directly in their lives, guiding them, telling them on which door to knock, to which person to go in order to do personal work, telling them that this is the will of the Lord. These people are influenced by emotionalism. Some years back, while in a meeting in a southern state, a gospel preacher and I called on the local Pentecostal preacher who'd been making attack after attack on the Lord's church in that city. When we would get him into a corner and show him a thus saith the Lord, his resort always was, that's what the Holy Spirit told me to say to you fellows. And it is almost impossible to do anything with a man that believes that he has something in him that far transcends anything that you and I can find in the Bible, the word of the living God. Emotionalism has not stayed outside the church of our Lord. I'm just as convinced as I can be that many of the fads and the gimmicks that some of our brethren have decided to pursue are based upon the very concept of emotionalism. Have you not heard people say, we can't get people to come and just study the word of the Lord. We've got to have something to really and truly interest them. That's emotionalism at work. Some of our people have decided it's old hat to come 
and sing together, pray together, open the Bible and study it together, partake of the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning, and give of our means the dignity and the reverence of Christian worship long characteristic of us, and yet many today are no longer pleased with that. They want to inject something totally different. Some of our brethren have decided if we just turn the lights down or completely out, and if we begin to hold hands, that will add a degree of interest. Well, I think it might, chemical interest, but it's not based upon true Christian fellowship, as anybody is aware that knows anything about human nature and how it operates between men and women. And isn't it significant that they like to hold the hand of a lady and not the hand of a fellow man, and the ladies like to hold the hands of a, of a man and not a fellow lady in some of these processes. Some of us who may not be so smart know exactly the stimulus that is responsible for all of that. I believe this modern mania for witnessing and testifying is simply based upon emotionalism, a man may be supposedly converted tonight, and then he's out witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ tomorrow. Probably couldn't get up and talk five minutes intelligently about the gospel of the Son of God if his life depended on it. And yet he's out telling people, now this is what the Lord has done for me. Brother uh, G.K. Wallace, a number of years ago, gave a splendid address at one of the Freed Hardeman lectures in suggesting that we have now reached the place where many are far more interested in the telling of stories for conversion than they are in hearkening back to the eunuch, to Cornelius, to Saul of Tarsus, to the jailer, or the other accounts of conversion about which we read in the Bible. Witnessing is built on that very concept. They're not interested in what Peter told the people on Pentecost to do. They want to tell you now, this is what the Lord has done for me. And this is how I became saved. And how they became saved may differ widely from how another person who is equally saved in his judgment had, uh, had received his salvation. And then we have creeping into the church, maybe galloping into the church, another wave of emotionalism. Some of our brethren are suggesting now we can just have any number of responses to the gospel plan that we really want to. A gospel preacher came to a certain city some years back and said we can baptize as many people in this meeting as you want to. Well I was in the audience and I thought it'd be nice if we could just baptize the whole town, several hundred people. I think we baptized maybe one or two in that meeting. Friends, there are three wills involved in this matter of conversion. The Lord's will, we know what that is, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4, and 5. It is the salvation of all. Our will is involved. Our will should be the same as his. Then there's the world's will about whether they're going to accept the truth when we have presented it. The Lord told us to go and make disciples, teach the nations, preach the gospel to the entire creation, and then when we have done that and lived it, it's the world's responsibility to either reject it or to receive it. But in the closing moments of our lesson, I want to suggest why emotionalism won't work as a religious foundation. Number one, it's man-centered and not God-centered. I could close that point right there and really have it covered sufficiently, couldn't I? But a second reason why it won't work, it will never result in Bible unity. Not the kind that Abraham had in mind when he said to Lot, we'd be brethren, Genesis 13. Certainly not the kind that David had in mind, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Certainly not the kind that our Lord prayed for, John 17, 20 through 23. Not the kind that Paul made a precious plea for, 1 Corinthians 1, 10, the verses following. And not that which composes the seven Christian uh, unities, Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. Emotionalism is totally impotent in producing any kind of real biblical unity. In the next place, all it can ever achieve is just simply allowing each person to become his own God and deciding how he's going to do, how he's going to be in a religious framework. It won't work because God's wisdom is not behind it, nor is it underneath it. 
Emotionalism will never produce anything except what we have seen in the ancient accounts of its exhibition and the modern accounts of its exhibition. It will not work because it is a rejection of the only standard that God has ever given us, namely his perfected word. In the last place, the Bible versus humanism. The Bible is the inspired word of God. Hundreds of times the Hebrew prophet said, the word of the Lord spake by me, came unto me, this is what the Lord has said. Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Peter affirms that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1 and 21. Emotionalism is not an inspired standard. In the second place, the Bible is infallible. Emotionalism is fallible. Brother Keeble used to say, and he said it so meaningfully, the Bible is right. The psalmist said it centuries before Keeble did, though. As the psalmist said, I am persuaded that all thy commandments pertaining to all things are right. Psalm 119 and 128. The Bible versus um, emotionalism in the sense that the Bible takes into consideration the whole human heart. Twice in the longest chapter of the Bible in divisions 1 and 2, Olive and Beth, mention is made of the whole heart. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole, W-H-O-L-E, heart. And then, uh, with my whole heart of I sought thee, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. The whole of the human heart includes man's intellect. That's the part with which he reasons things. It includes his emotions, but not his emotions only. And it includes his will, that with which he decides and executes a certain course of life for himself. Brother Hardiman used to preach a great sermon. Is the gospel as God gave it adapted to man as he made him? And this was basically his approach, showing that the gospel is adapted to man's intellectual nature, his emotional nature, and his decision-making apparatus. That is, his will department, that with which he decides to do the will of Almighty God. Emotionalism does not recognize the fullness or the wholeness of the human heart. That's another reason why it won't work. The Bible is authoritative. Emotionalism is not. The Bible rests upon the authority of God. Emotionalism rests upon no authority greater than human feelings. The Bible is a powerful standard. It's God's power to save. Emotionalism does not contain the power to save anybody from anything that is anything truly worthwhile. And the Bible is God's eternal word. It's his unchanging word. It's his immutable word. But emotionalism will continue to vary from generation to generation from individual to individual. It is an ever fickle kind of movement. It has just as many changes as human nature calls for. That's the reason it is not the Bible and emotionalism, as though both movements could go down parallel pathways. It is the Bible versus emotionalism. Thank you.